Welcome to St. Paul's. We come together on this day in a very special way, celebrating two wonderful events. The first is a whole year of worshiping virtually online. We remember those who have suffered during this year and all the suffering that's happened, and we pray that now as we begin to come out of the pandemic, we'll find ways to slowly begin to regather in person. So I look forward to sharing that news with you in the near future. It's also International Women's Day. And for many years, we at St. Paul's have been working to lift up the voice of those whose voices have often been pushed down through our music and through our prayer. And so we do today. So I pray that you will be enriched by hearing these voices and praying together with us. Please feel free to join us on our YouTube channel or website. We'd love to be in touch with you. God forgives and heals us. We need your healing, merciful God. Give us true repentance. Some sins are plain to us. Some escape us. Some we cannot face. Set us free. Forgive us. Free to hear your word to us. Set us free to serve you. God forgives you. Forgive others. Forgive yourself. Through Christ, God has put away your sin. Approach your God in peace.
God be with you. Let us pray. Holy One, creator of the stars and seas, your steadfast love is shown to every living thing. Your word calls forth countless worlds and souls. Your law revives and refreshes. Forgive our misuse of your gifts that we may be transformed by your wisdom to manifest for others the mercy of our crucified and risen Lord. Amen. When the Hebrew people were liberated from slavery in Egypt, they began a new chapter in their relationship with God. The God who was faithful in bringing them to freedom now makes a covenant that requires the faithfulness of the liberated Hebrews. A reading from the book of Exodus. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that it is on the earth beneath, or that it is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents, to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
A reading from the Gospel according to John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle and sheep and doves, and the money changers were seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Judeans then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Judeans then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Please join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, help us this day to understand and celebrate your dream for the world, to be transformed in Jesus' love, and to use our gifts to make a difference for others. Amen. I won't say that I know just how Jesus felt on that day when he went into the temple but I have some inkling. A few years ago, I too went to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage. I went hoping to experience the places where Jesus lived and to understand and, or to help me understand better my own faith and what it meant in the context of where all that stuff actually happened. I went Also, because I wanted to experience the reality and the power of God in that holy land. I imagine spending time there in those holy places, soaking in the power of the Holy Spirit. I was especially looking forward to visiting the Church of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem. The church is built over the place where Jesus was crucified and laid in the tomb, and little uh, outcroppings of those very places remain, even though they're covered over by a lot of ornamental church stuff. For centuries, this one place has been the holiest place in all of Christendom. And so, On the day we arrived in Jerusalem, we traveled along the Via Della Rosa, the path, the traditional path that Jesus walked from his trial to his crucifixion. And at the end of that path, we turned a corner and walked into the back of the church. That holy moment where I was showing up at that holy place. But instead, the place was packed. There was noise. There was clutter of centuries of devotional accoutrements piled on top of that space. It was still amazing to be there. Don't get me wrong, but there were long lines near the tomb and near Golgotha, the crucifixion spot, and people were yakking and chatting to each other. And so I was disappointed that this holy place I had come to experience had so many distractions. So I have a sense of what Jesus may have been experiencing in a small way that day as he went to the temple for the sacred feast of Passover. Thousands of pilgrims coming to make animal sacrifices. A whole industry set up to help those who had traveled from long distances purchase animals and make offerings, all packed into a fairly small space. 
and all the activity drowning out the presence of God, who, as we remember, speaks in a still, small voice. It's no wonder Jesus wanted to drive out all the noise and the clutter so that he, and indeed everybody who else came, could find an encounter with God. But this story is more than about finding a quiet place to pray. It's about how a relationship with God gets cluttered up by things both profane and sacred. Consider our first line of the reading from the Hebrew Scripture today. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. This is similar to other covenant sayings, like when Abraham makes, or when God makes a promise to Abraham, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. Or in another place, do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Or sometimes we hear that word of God in the prophets. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youth will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But to those who wait for the Lord, he shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Each of these lines of scripture is a call for the people to place their whole trust in the one who created the world, who delivers, from, who delivers them from the things that imprison and bind them, to understand that this God is the God who promises blessings for you and through you for the whole world. I am the one who saves you. I am the one who is with you, says the Lord. I am the one who will bring you to life. And in the Ten Commandments today, only after reminding the people of God's saving power do the commandments lay out what it means to walk in whole relationship with God. It's telling that the first four commandments are all about idolatry and making space for God. You see, we humans have a tendency to forget that it is God that promises life. Faithful people easily fall into the trap of idolatry, which is counting on things that we devise and create to give us meaning or a sense of security, or even to define our own worth and the worth of others. And the idols are many. Reputation, stuff, and money, being from the right family or race, education, being attractive in the eyes of others. You can probably identify your own idols if you stop and think for a minute. And it's not that anything is necessarily, any of these things are necessarily bad in and of themselves. Indeed, sometimes these things are icons of the greatness and the wonder of God. But the danger is they become the first thing we think about in the morning and the last thing we think about at night. And they will so clutter our souls that they'll, for, they'll cause us to forget that the first thing is that God is at work liberating and leading 
and strengthening and healing. And so, when Jesus goes into that cluttered temple, it's not just that it's busy or that what the people are doing is somehow bad in itself. The danger is all this buying and selling and maybe even the holy sacrifices themselves have become the main reason these people are going to the temple. Carrying out some practice to get on God's good side while forgetting that God's very nature is to liberate and to heal and to pour out abundant blessings. And that same kind of clutter can extend to daily life as well. I wonder what the first thing you think about is when you wake up in the morning or the last thing at night or what creeps into your thoughts throughout the day repeatedly. What is it that's cluttering your mind and your soul? That's why we have a practice this Lent here at St. Paul's to stop and to take the time to examine our days so that we can remember God. So at the end of the day, or at the beginning, or any time really, we stop and walk the way of the examine. So I'd like to do that right now for just a moment together and give us that chance, wherever you are in your holy space, to let God come in through all the clutter. We begin by giving thanks. Take a moment and give thanks for those places where you have particularly known God's grace. Where have you seen God revealed in creation? Or in the loving presence of another person? Or in something you have read or in a surprising moment of peace. Invite the Holy Spirit in. Come Holy Spirit, shine through the clutter and help me see, to see you to see where you have been moving in my life and in the lives of others. Breathe into all of my life with your truth and grace. And now take a moment to rest in God the God who created all that is, the God who longs to be in relationship with you, the God who desires to set you free from all that draws you from life, the God who is coming to meet you. Take a moment to rest in God. And now, ask God to set you free from the things that are keeping you from a life fully lived in trust. On this day, when we remember and celebrate decluttering, name the many idols that have captured your attention and your trust. Call to mind the things and attributes that promise to keep you safe or give you life, but in trusting in them, they draw you away from the God of life. Ask forgiveness 
or your forgetfulness and determined to put lesser things in their proper place. And finally, look ahead with hopefulness and a renewed trust in God's intentions for you and for our world. Not a world that you will create on your own, but the hope of a day infused with the power of God's spirit of love. We can practice decluttering our souls and lives each day when we remember to start and end with God's promises and God's grace. And we can remember that what we count on to bring us life can often be the very things that keep us from truly living. But we can look for that decluttered space that leads to a decluttered life where God can fill each day with what truly makes life worth living. Prayers of the people, we pray this day for God's people throughout the world. For Mark, our bishop, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. We give thanks this day for the ministries of Thomas and Julie as they prepare for a new call. We pray for our parish vestry as they begin to map a way forward. In this moment of silence, I invite your own prayers for the church. We pray for justice and peace, for goodwill among nations and for the well-being of all people. We pray for all nations as they struggle to emerge from the global pandemic, and that all people, rich or poor, will share in the blessing or receive the vaccine. In this moment of silence, I invite your own prayers for all who work for justice and peace. We pray for the poor, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. We pray especially for those who are unhoused and those who work to find them shelter. We remember those who work for home and hope and life uh, moves in our own community. In this moment of silence, I invite your own prayers for those in need and trouble. We pray for those in need of healing this day. Especially we remember those on our parish prayer list, Thomas Lighty, Christopher, Joan Verlingo, Linda McLaughlin, Diane Miller, the Forrest family, 
Michelle Sloat, Susan Lawson, Dylan Toma, Lily Young, Van Epsesh, Laura Cope, Charles Vaughn, John and Arlene Bergeson, Nate Price, Alan Mulliken, Michelle Blair, Nan Kuslos, Tom Bryce, Renee and Bernard Kem, Wally Kevishaw, Jim Prescott, Murdoch family, especially Charlotte, and Livy and Bonnie. In this moment of silence, I invite your own prayers for those who are battling illness. We pray for those who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God and of God's purpose for this world. In this moment of silence, I invite your own prayers. We pray for those who have died. In this moment of silence, I invite your own prayers for those who have died. O oh God, by whose spirit we are formed and in whose life we find meaning, knit us together in the womb of sacred community, awakening our hearts to you and to the dignity of all people in every time and place. By the radical presence of your love among us, may we be restored and made whole, and may our bodies become instruments of truth as we join the great host of women who bring the glad tidings. Amen. We gather all our prayers in one voice as Jesus prayed. O our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
May God give you the grace and will to cast out the clutter in your soul. And may God give you the space to hear the word of life. And the blessing of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, be with you now and always. Amen. It's time to declutter and till our soul and the soul of our society. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord and your neighbor. Thanks be to God.